What's up, DC Nation? Back to another DC Comics review, and guys, today we're gonna do Green Lantern 80th Anniversary Super Spectacular Number One. And guys, they've um, DC's been releasing a lot of these lately. They had the Robin one, which is pretty great. The Catwoman one was actually pretty good too. The Joker one was my favorite, but this issue may this this whole comic may give the Joker one uh, pretty much a run for its money because this issue, this comic, I'll just come out and say it was an awesome um, hundred page special. It was really good. It would probably be close to the quality of the Joker one. But you'll find out my final score by the end of this video. But guys, we start out with this dope cover right here. It's actually a really co um, cool cover. I really like it. It shows Alan Scott. It shows Kyle Rayner, Jon Stewart, Hal Jordan. It's actually probably one of the best covers I've seen in a while. Like, there's so much on the page. And it's cool to see, all right? But the very first story is called Dark Things Cannot Stand the Light. And guys, it's written by James Tenyon Four and it's drawn by Gary Frank. Now, you know Gary Frank, he does great art, like Doomsday Clock is really known. Like, yeah, it's a great story by Jeff Johns, but the artwork by Gary Frank is really awesome. And this storyline, it's pretty much eight pages. All the artwork looks really good, especially the final splash page. Like, how the story is conveyed by Gary Frank is really good. Like, Gary Frank is probably one of the best DC artists at DC Comics. The only thing is it takes a while to get his art out, but for me, in my opinion, I'm fine with waiting for a product if it's really good. And at pretty much the level of Gary Frank, I'm fine with it. And honestly, we didn't have to wait for this product. Like, I didn't know Gary Frank was on this book until reading this and seeing his name and his artwork on this book and immediately started out this comic on the right note. But guys, enough about the art. The whole story is pretty much Alan Scott. It's Alan Scott's story in this book. And what we see is Alan Scott, he shows up to a house, he meets up with this girl, Doris Henton. And guys, pretty much he's talking to her, she's kind of like an older lady, and he, she finds out that he knew pretty much her son, Jimmy. Now, Jimmy died in like a train, right? There's a train, Alan, Alan was on that train with him, he saw fire, pretty much it went explosion, and Alan was the only survivor. He saw Jimmy die, but Alan survived because of the ring. The Green Lantern ring saved him pretty much. And what happens is she asks, hey, you were there, did you help him, did you save him? Pretty much, somebody was there um, out of that night that pretty much became like a Green Lantern. There's a pretty much a new hero in the city. And she's like, do you know anything about that? And I was like, no, I don't know anything about that. But she pretty much asked him, wait, so why did you not save Jimmy? Like, do you know what happened? And I was like, no, I was just a uh, lone survivor. But after that, I found out that there's these men who pretty much um, took down the rail tracks and caused this train to explode. And all these people had died. Now, she asks, hey, did you give him justice? And Alan, pretty much, Alan Scott says, yes, I pretty much did. He shows up, and you see this awesome image of Alan, drawn by Gary Frank, where she shows the facial expression, all right? Like, I really like Gary Frank's um, uh, facial expression, his artwork, because it shows that Alan's kind of angry. He's like, you killed all these people, you caused this train wreck, and he gets the Green Lantern ring out. So he pretty much got justice for all these people's deaths, pretty much Jimmy's death, and... The one that pretty much Doris Henton asked, he was like, hey, so the Green Lantern, there was like a fire thing. Like, pretty much she's talking about Green Lantern, this new hero, and she's like, pretty much Jimmy always fell alone. I hope he didn't feel alone in those final moments of his life. Like, she's like, I hope, I hope anybody doesn't feel that way. Like, they shouldn't feel alone. There should be somebody that puts light in darkness. When there's like the darkest times, there should just be somebody that shines through. And at that moment, Alan actually has the ring and he flies off as the Green Lantern. And you see pretty much Doris Henton look up, she's like, oh, it was you. And pretty much, he is the Green Lantern. It shows that pretty much he inspires people. He's the light in the tunnel. Like, he's pretty much, with all this darkness, people having their lives, all this death, all the bad stuff going on, he's the one that pretty much shines that light. It's really cool to see that. Like, there's a very, it was kind of like inspirational story. It's really cool. And it was cool seeing Alan Scott back. I really like Alan Scott's Green Lantern. And uh, I already said this, but Gary Frank's art really delivers it very well. It's probably one of the best stories in this book. And that's why I'm going to give the story a 9.5 out of 10. I definitely recommend it. It's a really great story to start off this comic. And it just sets up the tone. It's a really cool storyline. I really like it. But guys, for the first story out of this comic, let's get to the second story in this book. Now guys, the second story in this book is called Last Will. It's actually written by Jeff Johns, which we know he's a great writer. We did the whole Green Lantern, Sinestro Corpse War storyline, so we know he writes well. And then we have the artist, Ivan Rice, which has always been a great artist for Green Lantern. And Ivan Rice does a great job here. I really like his artwork, especially on different pages. When he pretty much like shows how Droid has Green Lantern, 
it, he, Ivan Rice is just one of the best artists for the Green Lantern. He knows how to make like those pretty much shiny panels and pretty much deliver that light that only Green Lantern comics can deliver. It's really cool. I really like it. And up there with that, I pretty much say that Ethan Van Skyver, Ivan Rice, uh, Hoffa Sandoval, those different artists really deliver very good artwork for a Green Lantern comic. I think they're like the best ones for that. But yeah, aside from Ivan Rice's art, we have a storyline for Jeff Johns. And what he shows is pretty much how Joy, he wakes up, he doesn't know where he's at, he's in an unknown place, right? And he doesn't know if he could breathe in this place. But he has the Green Lantern ring on to protect him. But that Green Lantern ring is dying out. That Green Lantern, Green Lantern ring is going to go out soon. How does he even know where he's at? But he has three messages to send. Three messages, that's it. Once he sends these three messages, pretty much the whole Green Lantern ring dies out. And it's pretty much like 50-50 chance. Is he going to die? Like pretty much lose breath? Or can he actually breathe on this planet? He doesn't know where he is. So, he pretty much sends his first message to the Green Lantern Corps, saying it's been an honor being a Green Lantern, and how he's pretty much served with them over the years. So, that was a good first message. The second message is pretty much to Batman, and pretty much it shows Green Lantern's respect for Batman. It's actually a pretty cool message. And the third message is pretty much a uh, message to Carol Ferris, which is pretty much the love interest to Hal Jordan. And he pretty much tells her that, hey, it's been great uh, knowing you, like you pretty much love my life, but move on, go find somebody else. And he sends these messages, right? And the Green Lantern ring finally dies out. Now, I think he's a dead man. He's like, oh, this is it. I'm going to die. But turns out he can breathe. He's like, what the heck? So he walks out and turns out he's in Las Vegas, Earth. So he didn't actually go anywhere. And what we see in the next panel is kind of jarring. He's pretty much, he's with the Justice League. The Justice League are laughing at him. He's never going to live this down. Pretty much, he went through this whole process of things going to die, when he could have just walked a couple of miles or so, and he would realize that he's on Earth. Now, that I really liked how he pretty much was accepting his death. Like, oh, I got to say his messages. I like that part of the storyline. The ending was kind of like, all right, I think it was kind of like a fun gag. Like, oh, he messed up. He didn't notice that he's actually on Earth. Like, I get that. But I wish there was a better ending, like a more, because the ending of this story didn't really match the tone of like the previous, pretty much the start of the story. Which I thought was like kind of a problem, but it was still a pretty solid storyline. And Jeff John's writing was pretty good too, so that's why I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. It's solid, just the ending was kind of weird for me, because it was, it was a great tone. It really like kept up that tone of, oh it was kind of dark, but it could be inspirational at the same time. But then it switched to just being like fun, that's it. That's the second story in this book. Let's get to the third story in this comic. The third story in this book is called The Mean of Fear. So this one is actually more Sinestro, um, pretty much led it, um, story. The last two stories, we have pretty much Alan Scott, the first one, Hal Jordan, the second. But this one is Sinestro, so, right? Which is really cool. It makes sense. Like, if one villain would get a story in this entire comic, it would be Sinestro. But we see it's written by Colin Bunn, and it's drawn by Doug Monick. Doug Monick does great on Green Lantern titles, especially in, like, the beginning of the New 52 with Jeff Johns. So he was great here. His artwork was great, all right? I really like his artwork here. But what we see is Sinestro comes upon pretty much a Green Lantern. And this Green Lantern is kind of helpless. And he's like, oh, you're a terrorist. You're the one that Green Lantern Corps pretty much cast aside. You're the terrorist. You always go against us. And Sinestro's like, no, you don't know me. He's like, I was actually a good Green Lantern at one point. And I actually had pretty much love. I had a wife. I was actually a good man. And I pretty much, yes, I had fear, but I cast that fear aside. But one day, pretty much his wife died. Everything went not so well. And pretty much that fear took over. And the Green Lantern Corps cast him aside. And now he's Sinestro. Pretty much the Green Lantern Corps were afraid of his power. That's what he thinks. But Sinestro tells us, and he's like, so, would you like to join me? Would you like to join me in doing all this stuff? And the Green Lantern says, no, I'm not going to join you. And Sinestro's like, are you afraid of me? And Green Lantern's like, no, I'm not afraid of you, just you're a terrorist. And that's where Sinestro gets his freaking uh, yellow ring, blasts the head off this Primus Green Lantern, kills him, and takes his ring to go find another replacement. Pretty much Sinestro's looking to all these Green Lanterns and trying to find, in a way, like an apprentice or somebody who gets what he's feeling, like gets his whole motivations. And that's what this whole story's about. He, he pretty much explains the meaning of fear to the Green Lantern. And I actually really like this because Sinestro is one of my favorite DC villains um, in the whole DC universe. So it was really cool seeing this. And the art by Doug Mog pretty much like conveyed it very well. So I really like the story. And that's why I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. I think it's solid. And it's actually a quick story, but there's a lot to unpack in. So that's what makes it great. But yeah, guys, so the third story out of this book, let's get to the fourth story in this comic. The fourth story in this book is called Primus Time Alone. It's pretty much like a green arrow and how Jordan team up. 
Now, before we pretty much get to the story, this story is pretty much written by Daniel O'Neill. And if you guys know, Daniel O'Neill did pass away actually this month. So, and I actually respect the, this writer. He actually does a great job. I haven't read a lot of his stories, but I know he's done great on pretty much obviously the Green Man to Green Arrow relationship. This story really shows it. Um, he might have done some Batman stuff too. I haven't read a lot of stuff, but the stuff I have read is really cool. And honestly, any writer that respects the character that they're writing about, I respect them. And Day O'Neill really does that. It shows how great of a writer he is. And I think pretty much we should say that it, it sucks that he died because he really pretty much put a lot forth into this comic industry and he should be forgotten. He's actually pretty much a um, pretty much DC Comics legend. He's done a lot of Batman stuff and he should be remembered for that. Um, pretty much going into the storyline, I think it's written very well by Daniel O'Neill. Like, it's really cool, actually. I like Green Arrow and how Jor and them team me up. I really like that in the comics, their interactions and stuff. And guys, also, this story is actually drawn by Mike uh, Grell. And what we see is pretty much Green Arrow is fighting against Clock King. He's fighting against the Clock King has this girl. Green Arrow pretty much dismantles Clock King and starts beating the crap out of him. It's just a bunch of violence. But how Jor shows up and says, like, hey, don't do that. That's when Green Arrow punches him in the face. And pretty much Green Arrow's kind of out of control. You see a lot, and he's taking it out and blocking, right? But Howell's like, hey, why are you doing that? Green Arrow's like, why have you been gone for so long? You've been gone for two months. What have you been doing? Now, what we find out is Green, um, Green Lantern, how Jordan was actually given a book by Black Canary, who's the love interest of Green Arrow. This book, this book pretty much, you read through it, you learn some things about yourself, and it's just a thing, a book to read to help with yourself pretty much. Because Hal Jordan and um, Oliver Queen, they pretty much see a lot of things on a daily basis when they're a hero. A lot of death, a lot of big things happening. And it could get them kind of like confused. Like, wait, should I actually save this person? So Hal took some time off, went to another planet, read this book, thought out some things, and now he pretty much has peace and can keep being a hero. So he tells Green Arrow, like, hey, maybe you should try this out. Like, actually try it out. Green Arrow's like, you know what? I'll actually try it out. Put away our differences. You leave actually with friends, so I'll try out what you did. So the story actually ends with Green Arrow going to the Fortress of Solitude, a place of solitude that he can read this book and think about all his actions and how he can make peace with himself. Now, how Green Arrow flies away, and that's how the story ends. It's a kind of simple, but a very interesting story, and I really like all the interactions between Green Arrow and Hal, and how this pretty much shows, like, how it is to be a hero. Like, what you go through, how you pretty much, um, come up with the piece. And it's really cool, I like it. Daniel O'Neill did a great job in the story, and that's why I'm gonna give it an 8.5 out of the Saul storyline, and, uh, yeah, I recommend it. But guys, the fourth story out of this book, let's get the fifth story in this comic. So guys, the fifth story in this book, the halfway point pretty much of this entire comic, is called Legacy. And it's written by Ron Mars, and it's drawn by pretty much Daryl Banks. Now the art is pretty solid, it's nothing anything fantastic, but pretty much convinced story well enough. Now the writing is fine, there's only some really interesting stuff in the story, but some of it is kind of filler and not as great writing. But pretty much the story is Kyle Rayner. This is Kyle Rayner's story in this entire comic and we see him show up to like a storage unit he meets up with a storage guy that's from we call him and he sent a guy gardener to pretty much check out the storage unit and see if there's anything they can use pretty much from past fights in the green lantern corpse now we see him talk with the storage guy and the storage guy is like hey you were the very first one you kept everything going you protected um, all these places you protected earth and kyle's like yeah i was pretty much the solo guy i was a solo green lantern in the sector but now there's a lot of us Hal, uh, John Stewart, Guy Gardner, and Storage Unit's like, yeah, I get that, but you're the one that pretty much had a legacy. You have a legacy here because you kept going. And that's when pretty much they talk a little bit, and Kyle's kind of inspired by that, but he finds like a robot, and he's like, oh, it must be kind of dead, right? Like Guy Gardner wouldn't leave something like that. But the robot comes alive. He's like, man, why did I not suspect this? Guy Gardner never checks anything, right? Guy Gardner's kind of like that. But what we see is this robot attacks the storage unit guy, Kyle beats this robot and saves the storage unit guy and actually then leaves. And he pretty much didn't find anything, anything there, but he did get a cool interaction with the storage uh, unit guy about how he's pretty much left a legacy. And it pretty much shows that Kyle Rayner is a great character and he was actually the main Green Lantern for a short period in the whole Green Lantern mythology. And this story pretty much shows that. But I really like this one, it's pretty solid. Um, 
I really like the whole Lexi part of it. The whole fight out the robot and the guy Gardner stuff. That wasn't as great. It was kind of just filler. But I do like the whole thing that Kyle Rayner has left a legacy on the Green Lantern name. Like, that was cool. But guys, I give this from a story a 7.5. I would say it's passable. It's not, it's not one of the great ones in this book, but it's still pretty solid. But guys, we're at the halfway point, so let's get to the sixth story in this book. So the sixth story in this book is actually called Heart of the Corpse. And it's written by Peter J. Thompson. You guys know I like Peter J. Thompson as a writer. And it's drawn by Fernando Cacerin. Now, Fernando Cacerin is uh, from his artwork. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right, though. But his artwork, it's solid here. He's not one of my favorite artists. Like, sometimes artwork's kind of wonky and kind of weird. But here, it's solid enough. But what we see in the story is pretty much, we see Guy Garden at the beginning. He's at pretty much a bar on Oa, and he's talking to these people, and he's kind of drunk, but not super drunk. And he's saying, oh yeah, I beat the anti monitor I fought off against Mongol. He's telling all these fake stories, but he's summoned by Salak, which is pretty much like a robot of the Green Lantern Corps. He's like, hey, you and Kelwalk have pretty much had like a mission to go save some people. But before we get this, Guy Gardner go gets Kelwalk. Kelwalk is actually pretty much at the gym. I would say like a Green Lantern, or pretty much the gym at Oa, and we see pretty much Kelowog benching a lot of weight. Kelowog is benching, right? He's doing great. But we see Kelowog, he then goes with Guy Gardner. Kelowog's kind of mean, like he's kind of grumpy, he's not, he's kind of sad, because you can't blame him, this is actually the day that pretty much his family died. So you can't really blame him that he'd be a little sad. But there's all there's also the day of something else, which we'll find out later. But what we see is Guy Gardner and Kellogg show up to Salak, and the whole mission is go to a plant and save these people, right? These two Green Lanterns. Now they show up to a plant, uh, they actually go behind like a asteroid to pretty much um, go in and ambush the whole uh, people who are guarding these two Green Lanterns. But it turns out they make it there and they get ambushed by these rock uh Creatures, pretty much. They get attacked. Guy Gardner saves the two Green Lanterns. Kellogg keeps fighting off at the best he can, but he makes it through a hole and he sees all these Green Lanterns. They say happy birthday. So pretty much this is Kellogg's birthday, and it makes sense that he'd be a little sad, but he notices that hey, I might have lost my my real family, but I have a family with the Green Lantern Corps. You guys pretty much threw me a party, a birthday party, your way, and he feels good about that. It shows that all these Green Lanterns are a family, and they're all one, and that's what drives them. It's really cool. And I'm a big fan of Kelowog. He's a great character. Guy Gardner's a great character. Usually their interactions in comics are really hilarious, but here, they're hilarious kind of in this um, story, but they're more very thought out, and it shows more like interesting interactions, which I really like. But yeah, guys, this is an overall pretty solid storyline. That's why I'm gonna give it an eight out of 10. I recommend it. But yes, let's get to the seventh story in this book. Now, the seventh story is called Reverse the Polarity. Now, this story is actually pretty interesting. Now, it's written by... Now, it's written by Charlotte McDuff, and it's actually drawn by Chris Cross. Yeah, I'm not joking, guys. Chris Cross. But what we see, guys, is pretty much the Hawk Girl and John Stewart team up. They show up to the Watchtower. Uh, what vibes are you getting here? I'm getting Just the Unlimited vibes, all right? Immediately when I open this story, it's really cool. But we see him pretty much put this Alma away and pretty much just storing it so no villain can get because it's pretty powerful. But that's when Dr. Pallor shows up, which Dr. Pallor is okay, but he's not the greatest villain. We see him show up, he fights off, he fights off against Hawker and John Stewart, they have to team up, but uh, Dr. Polaris gets the Elmy, he comes 10 times stronger, he starts fighting him off, but Hawker and John Stewart pretty much team up, one goes above, one goes below, and they take him down, they get that element back. But pretty much this whole story shows the interactions and pretty much how they're pretty much a couple, John Stewart and Hawk Girl. And it reminds me of Justice League Unlimited a lot, and actually the Justice League series even more, because in that series, Hawk Girl and John Stewart were pretty much a couple. They're together, and it was really cool. I really like that. And seeing them on the Watchtower, it just remind me of Justice League Unlimited even more. So it was a really good storyline, and it was very simple. Like, the story itself wasn't super great, but just all the reminders and the references and, like, the vibes that I got from it was really cool. And that's why I'm going to give it a 7.5 out of 10. I think it's possible. You're probably like, wait, but you, you really liked it because it's Justice and Lynn and the Justice League, pretty much stuff like the vibes you got from it. Yeah, I really like the Hawkeye and John Stewart interactions, but the story itself was pretty much straightforward. But still, I recommend you should check it out. But guys, let's get to the eighth story in this book. Now, the eighth story in this book is called Thor. And this is actually written by Robert Van Diddy. He was the one who wrote the whole How and the Green Lantern Corps run, which I thought was a pretty cool run. I really liked it when they fought up against uh, Sinestro. And the artist on that run was pretty much Hoffa Sandoval. And he's the artist on this story. So it really brings everything together. 
But what we see is pretty much Hal Jordan, Jon Stewart, and Kyle Rayner. They are older, right? They're very old. It's been a while since they've been Green Lantern. They show up to a bar once a year to meet up, right? Just for old times sake. And they meet up there. They get much a drink from one like the waitresses. And they start talking about their adventures. How they fall off against Evil Star, which is actually an old Green Lantern um, villain from like... I think it was Golden Age or Silver Age, but like, they fought off against him, they fought off against Sinestro, and they keep laughing, they talk about stories, but then this conversation eventually leads to pretty much Guy Gardner. And at the beginning of the story, I was like, okay, Guy Gardner is just late, because they say, oh, he's always late to pretty much hangouts and stuff, so I'm like, okay, he's going to show up soon. But turns out, Guy Gardner's dead. He died. He died in battle. And what we see here is both these, uh, Jon Stewart, Kyle Rayner, and Hal Jordan, they're talking about, oh, he always had our back. You go into pretty much a fight, just punch somebody immediately. He, he, he's a great friend because he has your back. Yes, he gets into trouble, but he's always by your corner. And that's what makes him a great person. That's why they remember him. Now, they leave pretty much the bar or pretty much the place that they're meeting up. And they go to the gravesite of Guy Gardner. And they see the gravesite and they're pretty much like four corpsmen forever. And you see all of them pulled up the Green Lantern ring. And she shows that they had such a strong bond that they come once a year to pretty much remember Guy Gardner. It's a pretty powerful message. It pretty much gives Guy Gardner a great send-off if he needed one. It was really cool. And seeing all these corpsmen, one of my pretty much Kyle Ray, John Stewart, Hal Joy, all these different like corpsmen together, like some of my favorite Green Lanterns, just interacting was really cool. I really like the story. It's probably one of the best ones in the book. And that's why I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. I definitely recommend it. You should check it out. But guys, let's get to the ninth story in this book. Now, the second to last story in this entire book is called The Voice. And guys, what are some Green Lanterns we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah, we had Alan Scott, we had Kyle Ray, we had Hal Jory, we had pretty much um, Guy Gardner, Kellowad. We had all these different ones, right? But one, uh, two we haven't mentioned yet are Simon Bass and Jessica Cruz, pretty much the latest, like the newest Green Lanterns in Rebirth. Now, this story is more focused on um, Jessica Cruz, where the next one's focused on Simon Bass. But what we see here is Jessica Cruz talks about her anxiety, which is actually a big part of her character. Now, she always has anxiety going to a fight when she came to Green Lantern. And you see her pretty much with Simon Bass, they fall against a creature in space, and she almost dies because her anxiety takes over her. But Simon Bass saves her. Now, another instance is her fight off against another creature, pretty much like a shark creature, and Simon Bass gets hit. And he needs a rescue. He needs somebody to save him. And that's when pretty much uh, Jessica Cruz puts all her anxiety, all her fear aside to pretty much save him. And she actually does a great job. And Simon Bass is like, wow, you really grow as a person as a Green Lantern. You deserve that ring. And it pretty much shows how far Jessica Cruz has come. From pretty much a person with anxiety, a person who couldn't deal with her life, to now a Green Lantern that can actually save people and who can deal with her life. So that was pretty good. Jessica Cruz got a good story. Now, it is kind of quick, and the art, I'm not a big fan of. I'm actually not really a big fan of the art. Um, but it was still a pretty solid story. One of the weaker in the whole book, but still pretty decent. I actually pretty like it. And that's why I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. It's passable. It's pretty good. But yeah, guys, let's get to the final story in this entire book. Now, the final story is called Homegrown Hero. And this is a sign bad storyline. And weirdly enough, this is actually the weakest entire book for me, right? Because it just felt like the writing wasn't as good. It was, sometimes it would be like too much, um, pretty much war. It was very wordy and stuff. And the story itself wasn't really interesting. You see Simon Bass, he comes back from a mission as a Green Lantern. And he's with his family. He goes to like an art walk and stuff. He finds the guy with a gun. He stops the guy. And this person is pretty much like, pretty much Simon Bass is a Muslim. And this guy thinks he's a terrorist. It goes back to all that stuff. And I just... I know it's trying to like convey a message and stuff, but it, it just felt kind of forced how the writer was trying to do it. And it didn't really feel interesting to me. I, I kind of got bored reading it. And what we see is Simon Bass stops this guy, and he stops some other guys with guns and stuff who was going after his community. And it shows that Simon Bass is pretty much the hero of his community. And that's how it ends. He flies off, and that's it. It wasn't really that good. And guys, the artwork is kind of interesting. Like, I like the art style. But it kind of mismatches with the tone, all right? And it didn't really do it as good. It didn't really give it justice, right? I feel like if the artwork was a little better, maybe the action would have been better. But the artwork feels like it was could have been better for a different story. Maybe like a more down-to-earth story. Where this one was kind of like, it was boring, but it at least had some action. But when the action is really, isn't really like conveyed well, it doesn't really make the action good. So yeah, guys, this is overall, like, I'd say by far the weakest one. Like, it's not a terrible story. It's still, like, okay. But it's just like pales in comparison to the other ones. That's why I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. 
It, it, it's not like bad, it's not like uh, forgettable, but it's weaker than the others. But guys, overall this book was an awesome book. I really like this Green Lantern 8th Ambrose too. There's a lot of great storylines in here. Especially the Robert Venditti one with like it was Tile 4 with Hal Jordan, John Stewart, and Prima Kyle Rayo getting back together to pretty much remember um Prima Scott Gardner. Also the very first story with pretty much Gary Frank and James Tenyon Ford, pretty much about Alan Scott, that was really cool. And pretty much all these different storylines pulling out these different um, characters in Green Lantern lore, like Sinestro, Kyle Rayner, um, pretty much Hal Jordan, especially Jeff John's one that was pretty good, and all these different uh, characters like Simon Bass, Jesse Cruz, it really highlighted all these characters and gave them a great 80th anniversary, like I really liked it. Now I think the Joker one was a little better, but this one does come close, and that's why I'm going to get the entire comic at 8.5 out of 10, I recommend it, you guys should check it out. 10 stories, um, pretty much each story is 8 pages, so pretty much 8 pages. You also get some pretty much like different artists, like do different like um, variant, variant covers inside the book. It actually looks really cool. And you also get at the end, like pretty much different pages that tells like the origin and like a summary of each character, like Alan Scott, Green Lantern, um, uh, Green Lantern Kyle Rayner, Hal Joy, John Stewart actually tells that. And guys, speaking of John Stewart, I really like that story of John Stewart and Hawker. Like, that was actually really good. Like, the story itself was pretty straightforward, but the whole, like, the vibe that gave me up from his Justice Unlimited Justice was really cool. But yeah, guys, this was a great comic. I recommend it. And guys, the constant below, tell me what your favorite storyline was. What was your least favorite? I would say my favorite was probably either the first one, which is, like, pretty much the Alan Scott one, or the one with pretty much, um, the four. It was like Hal Jordan, John Stewart, and Kyle Rand getting back together to remember um, Guy Gardner. I really like those two. But guys, my least favorite will obviously be the last one. Also, if you like the video, give a big thumbs up to the channel. Make sure to subscribe to my next um, DC Comics review. I think this is actually the last 8th anniversary one. I don't think DC is releasing any ones like anytime soon. They had Robin, Catwoman, and Joker, Green Lantern. They're probably going to take a break for a while. But I've been enjoying reading these ones. These have been really cool. Having 10 stories like... Pretty much a couple weeks ago was a Joker one. So DC has released a lot of content, which I like. But guys, thanks for watching, and peace out.